Here's the other thing, which pertains to the middle of this. I think part of the difficulty with the New Testament is we don't actually know with a lot of these documents where they were written to, but there is some good evidence for suggesting that 1 Timothy is written to the church or to somebody who's in Ephesus. In Ephesus, there is one big temple, which you can still see the ruins of today, which is the temple of, of Diana or Artemis in, in Greek. And the thing about the cult of Artemis is that it was a female-only cult. It was a female goddess, they had female priestesses. And though there were other, plenty of other religions in Ephesus, it was a great metropolis, this was the big one, the big local civic religion was one in which women were the key leaders. Now, what's going to happen when a little group discover Jesus and discover that there's, hey, this whole new thing going on which people are calling the way or following the Messiah or whatever it is? One of the most natural things would be, since men and women are drawn into this, for people to assume locally that the women should take over the leadership. Yes. And the key word here, uh, when it says assume authority, is... Uh, it's actually a very difficult word. There's, I think I looked it up not long ago. There's 12 different meanings in the lexicon, and they're quite significantly different meanings. But I think in the context, the most likely meaning is I'm not saying, by telling you that women have a different way of doing stuff, that actually the women have got to take over leadership here. That's not where it's at. But the point about quietness and submission I don't think refers to women being quiet and submissive in relation to men in the congregation. The word quiet is the word for leisure, which comes through as somebody who has time to study. Now, you've asked me, you know, it's a complicated question, sure. so I'm, I'm going on a little, bit, yes. a little bit longer. But think about Mary and Martha in Luke 10. Um, Mary, notoriously, is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha is busy in the kitchen and gets cross. Yes. Our normal picture of that in the modern Western world is Mary sitting there dewy-eyed, gazing up in raptures at this wonderful teacher. And there may be a frisson of that as well, that Martha would actually like to be doing that and she doesn't feel she's able to, whatever. But to sit at the feet of a teacher, think of Paul sitting at the feet of Gamaliel. Paul wasn't gazing up dewy-eyed at Gamaliel. Paul was learning how to be a Torah scholar so that he could be a teacher. Mary has, as it were, invaded the male space in the house, which is where the disciples are learning from the teacher, and disciples learn from a teacher in order to be teachers themselves, and Jesus says, she belongs here. That's one of the most yes. explosive little scenes in Luke's Gospel. So I, the way, I forget the exact words I use in my translation, but I think he's saying, women have to be given, as the men might not want to give them, the leisure to study submissively submissively in the sense of they've got to learn from God like the rest of us, and that then she must have the leisure to do that. But I'm not saying that the women have got to take over the leadership because right. we're not like the cult of Artemis down the road. Now, that doesn't solve all the problems in this passage. I have written about this in various yes. places, but I think that's at the heart of it, that he's wrestling with this very difficult issue, which we still have, of men tending to fall into the stereotypes and women tending to fall into the stereotypes, saying, no, we've got different ways of doing being male and being female, but, I mean, you are still male and you are still female, but here's how to move from where we are towards where we need to get with appropriate male and female leadership. So th that's, that's how I've taken this passage. I, there's, I know there's half sure. a dozen other issues in there which we could look at. Sure, well, but, but uh, what's interesting, though, Tom, is that for most of us, we would read, read our Bibles, we'd read it like the way that I had read yep, it yep, yep. and understand it in a particular way. Mm -hmm, You've mm -hmm. now just given a completely different understanding to it. So for most of us, we're reading Scripture and interpreting it ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And in we, interpreting it wrongly. Well, we all have to go through this, and this is why the task of both historical scholarship and translation has to go on, because every generation will have blind spots, and it's the task of the next generation um, to say, oh, pity about that, right, now we're going to do some more work on this. And, you know, some archaeologists have dug up some new manuscripts with different uses of that word. Hey, well, maybe that means this now. 
And one of the joys of being a biblical scholar is watching that going on. Sure. Whether or not you're doing that particular bit yourself, somebody publishes an article and suddenly scales fall from your eyes and that's what Isaiah was getting at in chapter 11, or whatever it is. You know. So what about um, the last bit of that, that women are going to... Be saved through childbearing. Yeah. Um, what, that, what, that's, does that mean every, every woman has to have a baby? Wouldn't that be uh, interesting? No. Um, no. Uh, cl clearly not. They seem to have been reading Genesis 3 in a way which said that the pain that a woman has in childbearing is a sort of special curse on Eve for being the first to sin or whatever it was. And uh, it seems to me that what is being said here is, look, okay, she will have to bear children and that will be painful, but this doesn't mean that she's under some special curse. In and through that process, God will be at work and will rescue her and deliver her. I mean, it's, I think it's a much more positive thing yes. than we've... Uh, and, you know, I might be wrong. And this translation might be wrong. There may be a third alternative. I'm, I'm not saying this is absolutely necessarily right. But the more I read it, the more this is where I think it is. And part of the reason I think that is because of all the other things that are said in the New Testament about women yes. who are actually in positions of leadership in the New Testament. I mean, Romans 16 is an example. Oddly, 1 Corinthians 11 is an example. The bit about women's um, headdress, headgear, we've been so bothered about the headgear that we've often ignored the fact that Paul is talking about women who are praying or prophesying in the community. In other words, these are women who are leading in part of the worship. Yes. They're not just being silent. Um, Paul's concerned that when they're praying and prophesying within the leadership of the church, they actually look like women when they're doing it. That's a very interesting That's challenge. Very interesting. That was pretty good, actually. Well. <laughs>